Good morning and welcome to Rose Red Homestead, where today we are going to be touching on all three of our major themes for our YouTube channel. Emergency preparedness, food security, and self-reliance. We are going to do pressure canning chicken for beginners. Now, whenever I do a video, a canning video in particular for beginners, I take just a little bit extra time and explain a few things that beginning canners might need to be reminded about. The interesting thing is that every time we do a video that says for beginners, um, we have a lot of people chime in with the comments and say, I've canned for 50 years, but this was a great refresher for me. So this video is really, while it has a few extra things, it's a really good reminder for any of us who have been canning for a really long time. Um, the, the, the rules for canning or the recommendations for canning change over time, so it's always good to have a little bit of a refresher course. So on Monday, for our Micro Moment Monday, just a couple of days ago, we introduced our audience to the fairly new website that the University of Georgia and the USDA have collaborated on. You, um, the University of Georgia is now the face for the National Center for Home Food Preservation. And their new website is fantastic. I'm going to link you to that video at the end of this video. So if you missed that presentation on Monday, it's like eight minutes long. Uh, you can click on that and you'll know more what I'm talking about. I went up to that website this morning, and as I explained on Monday's video, you can now just click a little link and print whatever recipe you are interested in. This is canning, uh, pressure canning for chicken or rabbit, and it is the same recipe that is right out of the USDA guidelines for home canning. I have prepped the chicken. We bought, uh, Jim brought home 10 pounds of chicken breasts boneless, skinless chicken breasts from Costco. And we thawed that in the refrigerator overnight and we have this much chicken and I have cut it into chunks. This is about the size of the chunks that I do. And I eliminated some of the fat as, as much as I could, um, which was not very much considering 10 pounds of meat. So my guess is that we're going to get around nine pints of chicken. Now, this recipe has two ways that we can do that. We can either do it by hot pack or raw pack. Now, they recommend or they state that hot pack, well, let me read you what it says. The hot pack is preferred for best liquid cover and quality during storage. So, with hot pack, we will be pre-cooking the chicken, not until it's done, but just until it's about halfway or three quarters done. And then we will reserve the water that it was cooked in to use to cover the pieces in the jar. And I'll show you all that. With raw pack, we're just going to drop these chicken chunks right in the jars raw and add no liquid. It's all very clear in the recipe and you can print that recipe off and then um, relate it to what we're going to be doing on this channel. Um, so what I want to do right now is get our chicken started that we are going to pre-cook. So I'm just going to take about half of these pieces and I'm going to cover them with water. I want enough liquid that I can cover, um, use it to cover the pieces after they have boiled. So I'm just going to put this on the stove and we will boil it for about, oh, probably about 12, maybe 15 minutes. Because meat is a low acid food along with vegetables, we need to use a pressure canner to process it in order to ensure that if there happen to be, which is unlikely, but still we prepare, in, in the unlikely event that there may be some botulism spores, this pressure canner allows the temperature to get up well beyond the boiling point, up to 240 to 250 degrees Fahrenheit, which kills the spores. So that is why we need to um, pressure can low acid foods. So this is a pressure canner. This is a Presto 
Um, I have a list of products that you can find in our Amazon store if you're wanting to look at the canning equipment that we have tried and tested and think is, is pretty darned okay. So a pressure canner. has a big tub like this. This one will hold seven quarts or about 16 pints. And I have two racks. Always a rack needs to go in the bottom. Jars should never touch the, the bottom of a pan when we are processing them. I'm going to hold this second rack in reserve if we need to put it in as a second layer for however many uh, pints we get, um, then we will do so. And you can can this chicken in either pints or quarts. Uh, Jim and I can our meats generally in pints because there's just two of us and it's very much more convenient that way. There always must be water in the bottom of this canner, but the water cannot come up above the level of the jars. So read the instructions on your pressure canner. I put about two and a half inches of water in the bottom. It comes up on the jars probably about this far on the bottom level and that ensures that there is enough water to generate the steam, which then needs to fill the entire canner, pushing the air out, replacing it with that steam that is then under pressure, and we hold that for a certain length of time. The lid is where the important action is on your pressure canner. Your lid will have a vent of some kind, and it may have a dial. Mine is a dial canner, so that dial goes up to show me the exact amount of pressure that is needed for our elevation, which is 13 pounds on this. If you don't have a dial, then you need to look at the recipe, and it will tell you exactly 0 to 2,000 feet, 2 to 4,000 feet, 4 to 6,000 feet, and this is where we are. But you find where you are on this chart and it will tell you the amount of pressure that is needed for it to maintain without dipping below. You can go above but not below that. Now, if you have a dial canner, you need to do one of two things. You need to have this regulated often. I have not had mine checked for accuracy ever because the other thing is what goes over this vent is a weighted gauge. The weighted gauge that comes with this um, unit is a 15 pound gauge. So our optimum pressure is 13 PSI, pounds per square inch, but we can go from 13 to 15. So if I put this on here and it starts to jiggle, I know that inside the pressure has reached 15 PSI and that is still fine for our elevation. You always want to check to be sure of two things. You want to look through the vent to be sure that you see daylight on the other side, that that vent is clean, and that no food is up in there gumming it. And the other thing you want to ensure is that the gasket, underneath the gasket there is no food or anything else that might um, interrupt the closure of the pressure. So I'm going to get some water in this and we're going to, this is aluminum, my stove top is induction and aluminum will not work on my stove top. So we have a camp stove outside in my canning center that we use to pressure can. Now the caveat with that is that that particular camp stove um, the lowest ever that I can get the pressure to go without the flame going out is 13. So that camp stove will not work if you live at a place that requires uh, pressure under 13. So we're going to get this out there and uh, put the heat on underneath it and get it started, just bringing the water to barely a simmer. All right, the next thing we're going to do is start, according to the recipe, we drop these chunks in the jars and pack it loosely. So that means we don't stomp it down or doing anything, do anything else. We need to leave an inch and a quarter headspace. 
So on my ruler, an inch and a quarter is between my two thumbs. So about that much down. So that is about an inch and a quarter. The reason that I like raw pack is you see how easy it is. You cut your chunks and then you just put them in the jar. And note that we're not filling those jars all the way to the top. That headspace is important. Headspace prevents siphoning, which is when liquid squeezes out of the jar. Um, the chicken will produce its own liquid, which is why we are not going to be adding any extra. And we will come back when the boiling chicken is ready to put into the jars. Here are the chicken pieces. They have boiled for a few minutes. They're not done all the way. The recipe says about two thirds. I'm guessing they're about two thirds done. So we're just going to drop the chicken pieces down in here. Again, leaving head space. And by using this funnel, I'm trying to protect the rims of the jars a little bit from getting too oily from the chicken fat. Now we're going to be putting this hot broth in these, leaving head space. The next thing we need to do is to release any air bubbles that might be in just in the jars where the liquid is. All right, this one needs just a little bit more liquid. All right, next we're going to wipe off the rims of every one of the jars with a paper towel that has been wetted with vinegar. The reason we use vinegar when we can meat is because meat has grease or fat associated with it. And if there's fat on the rims right here, it could prevent a good seal. So we want to make sure there's no residue of any kind, particularly fat, on the rims. And then we place the lids and we then place the band finger tight using only our fingers to tighten. So these we have five pints of the hot pack. We have six pints of the raw pack. The chicken was room temperature for these. It had sat out on the counter for about an hour, getting the chill off of it. The jars had been run through the dishwasher, and um, then I brought them out, and they were also on the rack for a little while at room temperature. We filled the hot pack with hot meat and hot liquid, so the jars are going in. These feel room temperature to the touch, while these feel very hot to the touch. So is that okay to do a single batch with both kinds of chicken? Yes, because we have followed the USDA guidelines for both. So we are now going to take these 11 pints out, and we will put six on the bottom and five on the top. So probably these six will go on the bottom, these five on the top, and we will show you how we're going to do that. So we'll see you outside in just a moment. So our canner is set, the water has been simmering, so I'm going to load in the raw pack first, and these I can touch with my hands because they are room temperature. Okay, Jim will come over and let you see what the canner looks like now. I'm placing the rack, see the, the water comes up about this far on the jars. So I'm placing the rack and now I'm going to be putting in 
the five hot ones. Canner is now loaded. The flame is on low. I'm going to now put the um, lid on. And you can see that the pressure is at zero. We leave this open because what has to happen now, and I'm going to turn it up to medium and get a higher boil going, what needs to happen now is that inside the canner, it is full of air, jars, and water. The jars need to stay, the water needs to stay, but that air will interfere with being able to get the canner up to the appropriate temperature. So it has to be driven out. The way we drive out the air is that we just replace it with steam. We get a really good boil going, and then that boil fills the canner with steam, pushes the air out the vent, and we see a nice stream of steam coming out here, and we need to let it vent like that for 10 minutes. So once it starts, we will bring you back to show you what that looks like. And then after 10 minutes, we will put the uh, weighted gauge on the top and hold that pressure inside to build it up to 13 PSI for where our elevation is. So we'll see you in just a few minutes when we get a good head of steam coming out of that vent. All right, as you can see, we have a very lovely head of steam. It is venting nicely. It has completed its 10 minutes of venting. So now we are just going to take the weighted gauge and just put it right over the top, being careful not to burn yourself. Now that is going to hold the pressure now inside and it will start to build. And once it gets up to 13, we need to regulate it so that it doesn't drop below 13. It can go up to 15 and we just don't want it to go below the um, pressure for our elevation. If that happens, we have to start counting all over again. Now for pints of chicken or rabbit, these need to process for 75 minutes. We do not start counting the time until our canner is up to pressure. It started to rise just a little bit. We'll be watching it. So once it gets up to 13, which is about right here, we will start timing it for 75 minutes when that 75 minutes is finished, we turn off the heat and just let it sit. We don't touch it until the pressure drops down to zero. And I'll be reminding you of that when we get to that point. So um, we will go ahead and let it come up to pressure and then we will start the timing. I thought we would bring you back just really quickly. The pressure is now up beyond 13. It's showing about 14 on our dial, and look at our, our weighted gauge. This kind of rocking tells me that the temperature inside, regardless of what this says, the temperature is 15. This is more accurate. So we're going to turn it down some, and then whenever I adjust down, and Jim is the same way, we wait here for a few minutes to be sure we didn't adjust it down too much. Plus, we have wind going today. Jim has built this nice windbreak, but we need to just be vigilant and make sure that the flame does not go out. The processing time ended a little over a half an hour ago, and uh, it, took quite, it took a half an hour for it to cool all the way down, and then we've given it an extra five minutes after the pressure is down to zero, so that uh, that helps prevent uh, siphoning. So now we're ready to go ahead and open it. First, I'm going to lift the weight to be sure that there's no more pressure, and there isn't. And so I'm going to just carefully open it. And when I take the lid off, I take it off away from me. So the steam goes the other direction. The top layer is the one that we pre-cooked. They are clear and beautiful. and it looks like we've had no siphoning. These are the raw pack. They also look really nice. They have produced that much liquid just from the chicken itself. So we'll put these on the other side of this pan.
you can see in the canner that the water is completely clear. So this is a great batch because we've had no siphoning. Hooray! Siphoning happens sometimes in spite of the, all the things that you can do. It is not anything to be worried about if it happens to you. So no concern. So long as the jars are filled up to at least halfway with the liquid, you're good. All right, we're going to get these in the house and then we will come back on and um, close things out. Here are the results of our efforts today. On this side are the uh, pre-cooked chicken. All right, so this is the hot pack and this is the raw pack. We dropped the pieces of chicken raw right down into the jars here and added no liquid. So you can see all of the liquid that has been produced during the processing time that has come from out of the chicken. Now, um, I just asked Jim if he could tell the difference and he said, well, it's really hard to tell the difference. But what we have um, kind of decided is that the liquid on this side is clearer. On, on this side, there is the whitish stuff that is uh, uh, present when we do raw pack. And um, they will taste both the same. I rarely do hot pack meats simply because the raw pack is so much easier. And um, the USDA says that these will store longer and keep better on your shelves. I have had no problem whatsoever with raw pack chicken. So I'm pushing these forward. I'm going to bring these in behind. So here is a pint and a quart that just came off of our food storage shelf. This is uh, September of 2021. This is October of 2021. So these are nearly three years old. Is that right? Two and a half. Yeah. So these are at least two and a half years old. And, um, and you can see the whitish stuff. These are both raw pack. And um, raw pack chicken, or even the hot pack chicken, I find is very, very tasty right out of the jar. I can eat this. It's a little bit more difficult for me to eat hamburger straight out of the jar. I always have to flavor it. We use that for um, things that also call for uh, strong flavorings like taco soup or things like that. Uh, but with the chicken, I can just eat it straight out of the jar. I make chicken salad with it. I make chicken enchiladas with it. Anything that you need cooked chicken for, you can use this for. And it is so convenient, so wonderful to have this on our food storage shelves. Now, we should start to hear some... Oh, some of these are already... So um, these will still need to pop. You can see some of them are super boiling here, boiling very, very strongly. Remember, just a little while ago, these were up at 240 degrees. 240 degrees is well above the boiling point. When the pressure comes down, that reduces the boiling point as well. And so, but nevertheless, the inside stays really, really hot for a little while. So we just let these sit here for about 24 hours in the morning. I will, um, these came out so clean, I probably won't need to wash them, but I always do. And I do remove the rings, although sometimes I will just keep the rings, I loosen the rings and keep them on the jar just because I have so little storage space for storing 600 bands, jar bands. But the reason why you want to remove the bands is because you don't want anything holding the lid in place in case it wants to break seal. But if you put it on very loose, then that band is not going to hold it in place if it wants to break seal. So this is our lesson on pressure canning chicken. Uh, for anyone who needed a refresher course or those of you that are just starting out, please make good use of the new USDA National Center for Home food preservation. Uh, that is such a wonderful resource for all of us who are uh, devoted to safe canning. So thank you so much. Share this with everybody that you can think of who might benefit from it. We really do appreciate our community so very much. And we will see you very soon for more videos.